Prince Edward County. Located at the eastern end of Lake Ontario, the county is virtually surrounded by water. A ferry of one kind or another has linked the region to the mainland ever since the arrival of the United Empire Loyalists. Hello, I'm Barry Penhale. Since settlement in this area began over two centuries ago, the county has evolved into a distinctive region. The characteristics of the landscape, the buildings, the communities, and the determination of the people are the result of the geographic location of this peninsula, jutting out into Lake Ontario. Join us as we explore some of the many stories of Prince Edward County, truly a place of heart. Campbell, a native of Prince Edward and publisher of County Magazine, has an intimate knowledge of this peaceful county. His family has farmed the land for three generations. Hi, Barry. Hi, you're welcome to Prince Edward County. I'm Steve Campbell. Publisher to publisher. That's right. How are you doing? Not too bad. We're here for a week. Yes, you want to take a tour of the county? Oh, but I have a going. Okay. Steve is often on the road, delving into the area's past, looking for the stories that will eventually appear in his magazine. Yeah, from the steeple, I think that you can see right across Rob. He pointed out that the county can boast some notable firsts. It is home of the oldest pharmacy in Canada, the first successful canning factory, and the oldest Methodist church in Ontario. And it is here that John A. Macdonald began his law career. Well, when you tour the county, you, you see uh, and a uh, relationship with the land and with the water on just about every front. Somebody once said, uh, what's in a name? And there are some tremendous place names here in the county. That's true. They, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. A, a lot of them, uh, uh, it's believed, were brought up from New York State. Uh, there, there are uh, place names in New York State that, that match uh, places like Cherry Valley and, and Milford in the south end of Prince Edward County that may have been brought up with the Loyalists uh, at the time of the American Revolution. And uh, on the other hand, we have a few Indian names like Wapus and Consecon uh, that have been retained through the years. And uh, even the carrying place was, uh, uh, got its English name because that was what the Indians referred to it as, being a, a shortcut across what is now the Murray Canal. Work began on the Murray Canal in 1882. Seven years later, it was completed. The 3.2 kilometer channel effectively cuts Prince Edward County from the mainland. The resulting island gives the county its nickname, Quinty's Isle. Today, the Murray Canal is mainly used by pleasure craft. Back in 1910, in its heyday, over 1,300 passenger and cargo vessels passed through the canal. Prince Edward County has always been a place of sanctuary. It provided a haven for both Loyalists and Quakers fleeing the persecution inflicted on them by the American Rebellion of 1776. One of the earliest Quaker settlements was in Bloomfield, Steve's next stop. The Bloomfield Weekend Fair is an annual summer event. Back in Victorian times, every town and village in the county had a small fair. They were the social event of the year. High-spirited men and women paraded the grounds, dressed in their finest, and there were prizes for everything from the best pair of matched horses to the best pair of socks. The cross-cut saw is a reminder of earlier times in Prince Edward. 
the first settlers encountered an ancient forest of pine and oak. But within a hundred years, the axe and saw had cleared the land and settlement was complete. Bloomfield is the home of County Magazine. It grew out of Steve Campbell's fascination for local history and his love of writing. Well, I, I started out as a cub reporter for the local newspaper, and uh, when I left there, I actually went into the printing business for a short time, but I really missed writing stories and traveling around the county and talking to people, so the idea of county magazines sort of uh, came to my mind, and uh, uh, against all odds, we sort of put the thing together, and, uh, and we've been going with that ever since for about 10 years now, I guess. Uh, we, we try to cover a wide range of material of what's happening now in the county and what's been happening in, in, the, in the past and, uh, and try to balance it out so there's a little something for everybody who lives here and that still has an appeal to the people who are familiar with the area and uh, look at it from the outside point of view. By 1850, the focus of life in the county had shifted from the farm to the village. In Ameliasburg, a recreated village depicts life before the turn of the century. The 1865 Prince Edward Directory described Ameliasburg, then called Roblin Mills, as having an extensive flouring mill, the property of Owen Roblin, from which it derives its name. There are a few stores, a blacksmith shop, post office, etc. Mail, semi-weekly. Population, about 100. In Wellington, the second largest community in Prince Edward. The cool lake breezes have made the town a favorite of tourists for a hundred years. Back then it was known as the coolest spot when the weather is hot. The manor on Main Street is the oldest house in the county, built around 1770. The Wellington Museum is housed in a former Quaker meeting house. Bill Greer lives in Wellington and has a long-standing interest in its history. I'm proud, I guess, in a way, to be a part of it and have seen things evolve and, and have read about what took place over the years. The Prince Edward Directory of 1865 reads, Wellington stands next to Picton as regards trade and population. There is certainly a good opening here for practical men with moderate capital. And uh, at one time, this was prior to incorporation in 1863, the Great Lakes fisheries caught a, a vast amount of, of whitefish, and uh, that, that seemed to make things very active around the village, I guess, as from all reports, they, they caught so many fish that it was almost unbelievable. And then, at the time the, the stocks ran out, then uh, it was into the barley days. Winds blowing to the south, ships of old. Cargo holds brimming with the grain of gold. Barley days, barley days, those barley days, those barley days. Mm -hmm. The barley days between 1860 and 1890 were the county's golden days. Some 15 million bushels were shipped by schooner, mainly to American brewers. By 1890, protectionism in the United States led to restrictive tariffs. Overnight, grain prices collapsed. The barley days were over. When the winds in time to the north they blew, then schooner sails knew those days were through. Barley days. There's a very important part of history here, and in 1879, two men 
fellow by the name of George Dunning and Wellington Boulder started uh, the first canning operation on an experimental basis in their home in Demaresto. That would be using the first tin cans with a uh, with using solder, hand soldered joints. And uh, they, they experimented, uh, as I say, in their home in Demaresto. And uh, the business seemed to look like it might flourish. And three years later, they, they built a canning factory in Mary Street in Picton. The success of the Picton cannery led to dozens of small factories throughout the county. Canning was soon to become what barley had been to the prosperity of the region. By 1902, nearly one-third of all Canadian canned fruits and vegetables came from Prince Edward County. It was grueling work. When the crops were ready, they had to be canned immediately. This often meant exhausting 17-hour workdays. By the early 1960s, competition from growers and canners in Western Ontario and the United States led to the demise of the county's canning industry. Today, only two canneries still operate. But the county has always relied on its agriculture. Fruit growing and dairying were started in the 1880s. In 1908, an editorial in the Picton Times proclaimed, a revolution has been wrought in farming methods in Prince Edward County. The abolition of the barley trade has proven a blessing to the agricultural community. The soil was becoming impoverished and the reward for the farmer's labor growing less and less every year. Since they turned their attention to dairying, steady progress has been made. The product of the land is largely consumed on the farm and returned to the soil. The fertility of the land is vastly improved. Today, dairying is still important to a number of county farmers and Prince Edward cheddar cheese is well known for its exceptional quality. The Black River Cheese Company has been making cheddar since 1901. The process begins by adding rennet, color, and starter to pasteurized milk. In about 30 minutes, a firm curd forms, which is then cut into small chunks and stirred in heated vats. The cheddar is eventually left to cure for several months or years before being packaged. Dairying, orchards, barley. The land has always been generous to the people of the county. Harold Inslee and his son Dale are commercial fishermen. Fishing played an important role in the county's early development. Many farmers on waterfront land fished to supplement their income and their diets. Between 1860 and 1890, fishermen hauled in huge catches of whitefish, herring, and trout, most of it destined for American markets. A tribute to the men who built the ships and those who sailed them is found in South Bay, home of the Mariner's Museum. Dave Cole is curator. What about the uh, shipbuilding traditions? Because I know there were a great many families locally that built ships. Can you tell me about some of them? Oh, yes. Right behind me, across the bay, there was the Colliers. They built ships and sailed them. And uh, oh, there was down on, on this side. All along here, there were different shipbuilders. They built their own ships, and they took their own cargo wherever found over or otherwise. What kind of ships? What class would they be? They were up to two masts to three masters at the most. From the beginning, ships and water transportation were a way of life for the settlers. 
At first, the vessels carried lumber. When the forests were cleared, the ship's holds were filled with the produce of the farms. By 1860, the principal cargo was grain. It made some ship owners rich, but for the sailors, life on the schooners was tough. Wages were no more than 20 to $25 a month. Living conditions were poor, cramped quarters, and a steady diet of pork and potatoes. Then you had to work, you had to work. It wasn't a case of just because it was going to freeze up, you had to stay on shore. No, you left to make money for the guy that owned the ship. These placid waters belie their danger. Whipped by the howling gales of fall and winter, the lake can extract a terrible price in lives and ships. On the southeast shore of Prince Edward County stands the remains of the Point Traverse Lighthouse, erected over a century ago. It bears silent witness to one of the most treacherous stretches of water in Lake Ontario. Off these shores, during the early days of shipping, more than 60 vessels sank with a loss of over 100 men. Sandbanks Provincial Park on the county's western shore is made up of two large baymouth sandbars. The biggest, the Westlake Bar, with dunes as high as a six-story building, forms the largest freshwater bar dune system in the world. Parks official John Boxall. About 10,000 years ago, with the last ice age, as it retreated, sands were left all along the lake shore as far east as, well, Hamilton. And the sand started traveling. The current sand with the prevailing westerly winds from Lake Ontario has brought the sand this far. And so initially was a little bay. What happened was the sand started piling up in this bay and soon approached above the water level. From there, the wind started taking over, blowing it further inland. And what we ended up was with a series of dunes starting at Lake Ontario behind us here to, to West Lake. Now, they sort of grew in size over the years, and eventually plants started colonizing them and stabilizing the sand. Settlement was to have a profound effect on the delicate ecology of the area. Timber was removed. And with the advent of the barley days, cattle were taken from productive fields to graze on the grassy slopes of the sandbanks. The consequences were disastrous. And while the cattle ate all the existing vegetation, plus the erosion from their hooves and such, started the sand in motion. And they had some buildings out, you know, farmers had outhouses and barns and such. The sand started encroaching on those, so they went to the government for help eventually. One of those who went to seek help was a local farmer, Amos McDonald. His efforts eventually paid off. In 1921, the Sandbanks Forestry Station was established. Thousands of scotch pines were planted and a wooden barrier fence erected in an attempt to hold back the advancing dunes. However, it wasn't until the 1950s and the 1960s that intensive planting finally halted the sands. Back in the early 1900s, as Amos McDonald and his neighbors struggled to save their fields, little did they realize that this area would one day take on a new life as a place for summer recreation. The event that attracts people to this area is the Quinty Summer Music Festival. Here, the trio Lyra perform 19th century songs of the Auvergne region of France.
Picton, with a population of 4,000, is the largest town in the county. It was incorporated in 1837 and soon became a thriving lake port. During the 1800s, there were scores of small businesses in Picton, though in many cases, none seems to have specialized in any one type of merchandise. Walter Ross sold dry goods, groceries, and buffalo robes. At Roblin and Branscombe, druggists and dentists, besides getting your prescription filled and your dental plate fitted, you could buy household paints, books, and stationery. And if you paid in cash, cheap groceries. In addition to the commercial establishments, Picton, by 1846, contained four churches, two chapels, a fire and ladder company with engine, and a circulating library. There were three physicians and surgeons, one apothecary, and four lawyers. Picton's most famous lawyer was John A. MacDonald. Many years later, as prime minister, he remarked, I love the people of Prince Edward County. They vote for me time after time, and they never ask me for anything, and they never get anything. In 1860, the grandson of a United Empire loyalist wrote an account of his life in Prince Edward County. About this old place, many sweet as well as sad recollections cling. We are all wont to look back upon childhood's days as being the brightest and sweetest, and so they are. I often turn a backward gaze to those days and sigh that they are gone, but the past returns no more and I am leaving it all farther and still farther behind. Numerous and varied are the recollections centered there. They are like the slides in a dark lantern. When the light of memory is turned on them, the picture shows itself to the eye. And we may, in some cases, live over the past.